Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Health and Fitness Show with Tracy. I'm excited to bring you another show. For those of you who are new to the show, or and those of you that have been following me, you know that all my things I do with my courses, my writing, my books, my radio shows and podcasts, whatever I've done, it's basically just to help others, to bring knowledge out. Now I'm be interviewing people um, on my new, on my podcast, so I'm just hoping everything this podcast brings is just to help people. So today I have a special guest. We'll get right into it. I met her name is Dolly Stokes. Um, she is in the fitness industry like me, but we also became friends. But we met in about 2017 when we had a fit tour dinner and we had a lot of laughs and a lot of fun at one of the ideal conventions and we stayed in touch. So I'm going to introduce her, but I'm going to have her take over and tell you more things. But she makes courses. She Oh, I'm just I'm just gonna mess it all up right now. I'm gonna introduce her and let her tell you. But I'm excited excited to have her. But one of the things this podcast is bringing to you mostly, besides just letting you meet her and what she's done in her fitness career in her life, is she was diagnosed with MS in 2011, and her health and fitness and mental care has helped her, you know, progress through it and live with it. She's going to share more about that. She has worked with the research in it, with it, and a lot. So welcome, Dolly. Hi, Tracy. It's great to be here with you today. I was so excited that you asked me to participate in your podcast. Me too. I'm so glad you said yes. So let's just right into it. Tell us more about how you work with Fitur and you've made you made the courses there. She has these great courses she's made. My favorite is the myofascia release one. I just love it. She's also a massage licensed massage therapist too. So tell us more about it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well um so my Fit Tour journey is is very long, maybe older than some of the people that um, are listening. But um, I started uh, with, uh, I met Carol Ann, some of people that follow Fit Tour and know about Fit Tour know Carol Ann, and I met her in 2002, and she was recruiting master trainers for Fit Tour. And so I was one of the first master trainers that she recruited. So that was in 2002. And um, I was so excited because I'm from um, Alabama. And so you don't have a lot of uh, master trainers from Alabama. <laughs> They're usually from California or the West or either um, New York or Miami, but um, usually not from Alabama. So I was really <laughs> excited to get to represent Fit Tour here as a master trainer. And then um, uh, I it evolved into Carol Ann asking me to be her assistant um, to help her with um, scheduling workshops and managing the uh, Fit Tour pro trainers around the country. Um, I didn't with know that. Uh -huh. I, didn't, I didn't know that part. Anyway, oh, you didn't know that part. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, then, um, so Carol Ann, um, you know, I worked for her under her. And then in like 2007, um, Fit Tour asked me to be the director of education. And so I took, that on. Um, and uh, then uh, I just managed the courses um, that had already been written and also put together courses with textbooks that um, had been written through Human Kinetics. And then uh, I guess in 2010, um, I had a successful uh, boot camp business. Let's back up a little bit. So in 2005, I um, Hurricane Katrina hit the, the um, South Alabama and um, the YMCA where I would, did personal training and I trained instructors and um, worked was um, just totally blown away. Oh, man. The, the whole building was blown away. So I had clients there and um, it was just wiped out. And I would, um, so I was just getting divorced. I was a single mom. I was in massage therapy school also. And I really needed, like, it was like my income was just gone. Like yeah. it's gone. Um, and so I was still able to continue training um, instructors for the YMCA at other branches, but that main branch that was wiped out from the hurricane. Um, that's where most of my personal training business was and where I taught most of my classes and where my income mostly came from. So um, one of my clients happened to know an owner 
of a dance studio in the small town that I live in, which is about 30 miles from uh, Mobile. And she said, why don't you ask my friend if you can rent space from her and do personal training? And so I said, okay. So um, I asked her friend and her friend was like, yes, you can rent space from us when we don't have dance classes. So that worked perfect. It was early in the morning until like maybe 12 o'clock in the afternoon that they had space available for me. So, um, I don't know if you want me to go into the story of my boot camps, but anyway, I started a boot camp business and I went from the first boot camp I held in our little town. Um, I had three people and um, they had such amazing results that um, it was only a two week boot camp. Um, and they all, all three of them had amazing results, lost a whole bunch of weight. Um, I won't even go into how unhealthy it was the way I had a meeting and exercise. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, they went to a party um, on the Saturday night after we finished up on Friday and a lot of people saw them. And this was before text messages. And um, I had my phone on Sunday was blowing up with people calling me, asking me when I was doing the next boot camp, And so I was like, well, I wasn't really planning on doing another boot camp because I was just doing it for these three girls that wanted me to do it for them. Um, and so I said, uh, next week, we'll start next week. <laughs> so I just threw together a boot camp, And my first boot camp, I had 35 people. That's awesome. And, yeah, it was awesome. All I had was mats, and Pilates rings. And that and was like before boot camp became the fad. That was way, yeah, in 2005, it was before boot camp was a fad, before doing out, outdoor boot camps was a fad and that kind of thing. So anyway, long story short, that uh, spearheaded me to have my own studio in um, Fairhope. And I was a boot camp trainer for many, many, many years. And I'm um, still known. Sometimes people um, see me on the street and they're like, do you still do boot camps? And I'm like, oh, no, I don't do boot camps anymore. Um, because I, I woke up one day and I said, oh, my gosh, these people are coming to me for two week boot camps. And it's the same group of people just rotating through. And every 90 days, they're coming to me to lose the same 10 pounds. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> you know, maybe I'm really not helping them to be healthy. You know, I'm just yeah. helping them for the quick fix. So um, anyway, I quit doing the two week boot camps, and then I just started doing, you know, just comprehensive training. Um, and then, uh, you know, the nutrition, I was always a bodybuilder. So I followed like a bodybuilder diet, which was kind of keto-ish, you know? And so that was the diet that I gave everybody. And then when I was diagnosed with MS, um, I had a reality check that like, hey, you think you're like really healthy and you look super healthy and fit on the outside, but then on the inside, this nutrition that you've been doing is just horrible for you. So um, I changed all that with my clients and, um, you know, I lost a few because I wasn't doing the quick fix anymore, but I'm, pr I'm proud to say that I still have, um, you know, a really solid group of clients that have stuck with me um, since 2005, almost for 20 years now, um, that still come and work out with me, you know, two to four days a week. Um, so anyway, that's, that's my story. And, and that has to feel good to know that you did, you, you're something inside, you didn't feel good about something, you listened to it, and you made it so it feels better for you. Which is yes. good for you because you don't go to bed and I go, oh, you feel like, oh, you did something. Yeah, else. so yeah. that's, that's one thing that I've always, um, tried to do in my business and as a trainer is really stay true to my values and um and and uh you know really work with a good ethics mm -hmm. um code of ethics and so um consequently and I'm not I'm not I, I don't judge other trainers for what they do because everybody's got to do their own thing but I've never sold supplements because I feel like um I'm very influential on people and I feel like if I tell them you need to take this supplement and I'm selling it, that they're going to buy it because I, I delved into that for a little while. And it, um, it was, uh, you know, in 2008 when the market crashed and everything. Um, and I felt like some of my clients were spending money that they really didn't need to spend yeah. and were overextending themselves. And I felt like my influence over them um 
might lead them to maybe um, spend money they didn't need to spend. And I just didn't feel really good about that. So I just have never, uh, since that time, I, I quit selling supplements and I really, um, you know, just tell people I will make suggestions to them of different supplements that they could choose and let them choose the ones that work best for them. That's what I did too. I didn't like, I never liked selling, having a big thing come to me, but buy everything. I never wanted to be the sales right. and I wanted just to train them and be with them and fitness and nutrition, but I didn't want to always seem like the person trying to sell them a product. Cause mm -hmm. I'll be like two years and get the people like, Oh, they're selling me a product. It's not really for me. Cause you're selling them everybody. Yeah. I just never wanted that part. It bugged me. I don't know. Other people right. do find it's something with me, the same thing. I just didn't feel comfortable with it. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't, and I don't, I don't think people that do sell, you know, trainers, yeah, fitness trainers fine, yeah. that sell supplements, that there's anything wrong with it. It just didn't work for me. Yeah, me um, and so I'm not really good at selling. People a lot of times want me to sell things for them. And I'm really not good at it. I, I'm good at selling myself. <laughs> yeah. And that's what I sell. I am. I'm like, yeah. okay, I, I sell myself. And that's what I sell. And, you know, if you like what I offer, then great. If yeah. you don't, then that's okay too. You know, uh, uh, that's one thing I've learned also in my, um, what, 30 something years as a fitness trainer is that not everybody's going to like you. Not everybody's going to like your style of training. Not everybody's going to like your personality. Um, it's just, you know, and to never take it personal if a client that's been with me for a long time leaves, um, because maybe it just wasn't good for them at that time or whatever. And, you know, um, so that's, that's one thing I've learned is just to, to be yeah, true to because, yourself. Yeah. Cause it's hard on us if you take it. Yeah. Is yeah. If you, you don't understand that in all ways of life, because sometimes people just don't like you and it's hard and it hurts full, but you have to like learn to maneuver through that stuff or. Well, yeah. And then also on the other, a lot. <laughs> right. And then on the other hand, it, I found that it's okay for me to say, you know, this person, I don't really, I don't really care for this person that has come to me for, to train. So maybe it's not a good fit, you know? And so, um, you know, and, and that's a hard conversation to have with a client. Yeah. Um, but, but I have, I've had that conversation with clients and, and, um, and in the end, it works out better for them and for you, you know, um, so uh, especially in the small town we're in, because we, well, now it's, you know how, I don't know. Well, I lived in small, small so it used to be a small here. town when, uh, so when I first uh, started training in where I live, um, instead of in Mobile, the big, the big cities, which Mobile, Alabama is not a big city, <laughs> but um, anyway, there were only three trainers. And I was one of them. So it you didn't have a lot of trainers, but now there's now we have a lot of trainers because we've had an influx of people, especially since COVID, where people are moving to smaller places yeah. um, to live. So um, you know, you don't have you don't have so many people that want to work out with you because there's so many other trainers for them to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in a small town, there was only a few of us trainers too, and it was very different than the big city. Yes. Yeah, there's both. It was like, it's a, it was experience. <laughs> uh -huh. But okay. So a couple of questions for you. So one, you were diagnosed with MS, you said in 2011. Yes. Two questions. One, can you tell the listeners what MS is? Then the next question would be if I, I don't want to forget it. Um, how did you know? Did you have symptoms? Were you doing something else in a random test and the doctor goes, hey, you have this? Or were you like something's wrong and got checked out? So there's a okay. bunch of questions to mix in with your story. Okay, so I'll, I'll um, let me answer what MS is. It's uh, multiple sclerosis. And it is um, where uh, your immune system attacks your myelin in your brain. So your myelin is, um, it's like, uh, for instance, you have an electrical cord um, and uh, your um, your neural, um, I, you know, I have MS, so I have like a little bit of cognitive issues because my MS uh, affects my cognitive. But anyway, it's like the circuit um, gets frayed. So for instance, your iPhone um, cord, if it, if the, uh, if the um, rubber on the outside of it 
um, gets uh, uh, frayed or gets cut or whatever, and then the the uh, metal uh, electrical current things are are open to um, to the elements, then they can get disruptions. So that's a very yeah. good description. Okay, thank you, Brenda. So, like, if you have a sheath, the sheath that sheath wrapped so, around it, then it gets yeah. off. Yeah. So the myelin sheath. Um, that is wrapped around your neurons gets like frayed and then your neurons get um, like little, you know, where there's lesions. Okay. So um, we got, sometimes they're called lesions. Sometimes they're called plaques. So um, I guess about two year, two years before I was diagnosed with MS, I started, um, I can remember specifically in a boot camp workout that I was working out with my clients. We were doing skating side to side and power skates where you would pause and uh, balance on one foot and then, you know, power to the other leg. And I remember saying to my clients at the time, it was about a group of 15 girls. I said, y'all, do I look like totally uncoordinated on my left side? Because I just feel so uncoordinated. You're just and out they, of nowhere. You just yeah. that way. And okay. they were like, no, you you never look uncoordinated. You're so coordinated. Like your form is so good on everything. You don't look uncoordinated. But I could feel my left side just felt like totally just I like it was my left leg was just kind of flopping around or something. Like you felt like, like you didn't have control. I just felt like it was I had no un no it was like I couldn't feel where it was. Oh. Um, so anyway, that happened and I just kind of brushed it off and I was like, well, maybe I'm just imagining it. And I kept noticing it, but I just kept working through it. And was it like every few minutes or one day, not for a few days, or it just started and never stopped? It just started and it stayed for a while and then it just disappeared. But I just really didn't notice that it disappeared because I just didn't pay attention to it anyway, you know? So um, anyway, then uh, that was probably two years before I was diagnosed. And then about... Um, in, in April of 2010, we had the oil spill, the BP oil spill. You might be familiar with that. I don't know, but it was- I think the, I've heard of it, yeah. Um, yeah, the um, BP Horizon oil spill. And so um, I live on the Gulf of Mexico. Um, where I live is on Mobile Bay, but we're only like maybe 25 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. And um, then we have a vacation home in Northwest Florida that is on the on the Gulf of Mexico. Well, um, with the oil spill, they um, put out dispersants to disperse the oil. And on the day that they um, did the dispersants, I remember walking out onto our deck um, at the river and I was like, oh my gosh, I can't breathe. Like I can't like... And I went inside and got my husband. I said, come outside. Can you smell these dispersants? Can you? And he said, no, I, I don't, I don't notice anything. It didn't affect and, him. Um, okay. It didn't affect him. So then um, after that, I started getting brain fog and um, I started getting like real forgetful and real, like I was daydreaming all the time and um, just not real focused, which I've always been like super focused and super like multitasker and doing all this stuff. Well, I, you know, we didn't really notice it. I just remember my husband saying one time, like, hey, you need to pay attention. Like you just dropped something on my foot. You know, I was like, oh, uh, I'm sorry. You know, he's like, you're daydreaming. And I was like, I, I, I'm really paying attention. I don't know. And then um, later on that summer, I remember being at the beach and I hate to lie on the sand, like at the beach. I like to be in a beach chair. I do. <laughs> I, and I love being at the beach. I love it. If you've ever been to the beaches in Northwest Florida, they are beautiful. And I love being at the beach. But anyway, that whole summer, I would put put my beach towel down on the sand and just lie down on the sand and just go sound asleep, like drooling asleep. And that was never me. I was always, if we were at the beach, I was always in the surf. I was always walking up and down the beach. I was always super active. So, um, you know, I was just like, I don't know why I'm so tired. I don't know why I'm so like just lackadaisical and just not able to focus. Um, and then like in December of 2010, I um, 
had an incident where I, I was having like plantar fasciitis really bad. And so I was taking meloxicam, which is an anti-inflammatory. And um, over a weekend, I gained 25 pounds, wow. like within three days. And I was like, when I was breathing, it sounded like my husband thought I was having congestive heart failure because it was just gurgling in my chest. Like I had so much fluid. Yeah. And that also makes you retain water. In your, in yes. Your so I went to um, my um, internist and he ran all these tests and he was like, Dolly, I cannot find anything. Like I had heart tests run. I had all these, I mean, just amazing tests done. He was very thorough. And he said, are you on anti-inflammatories? And I said, yes. And he said, I want you to get off the anti-inflammatories. And he said, let me ask you this. Do you uh, use sucralose or anything with aspartame in it? And I drank a whole, so when I talked about earlier that my nutrition sucked, it really sucked. I would drink every day a whole pitcher of Crystal Light. Every day. Yeah. Yeah. And then I would have like four cups of coffee, sometimes six cups of coffee with like four packs of Splenda in each cup. Okay. So he said, I said, yeah, I do. And he was like, that's a little excessive on the aspartame and the sucralose. Could call on him to ask you that though. Yeah. Many Absolutely. Ask Absolutely. That kind of question. Yeah. So he said, I'm concerned that you might have like sucralose or aspartame poisoning. Holy crap. And so he said, I think you're toxic. So I want you to go off the anti-inflammatories and go off the aspartame and sucralose. And, you know, if your weight hasn't gone back down, if you haven't lost this fluid in the next three days, call me and I'm going to put you in the hospital. We're going to do some stuff, some other things. So guess and what? Were you just freaking out and going, oh my God, and worried as can be? Or yeah, you well, actually, <laughs> Tracy, at that point, I was so vain. I was just so worried about being uh, uh, 25 pounds, like, plumped up. Oh, you weren't thinking health. You were thinking, no, oh, girl, you don't no, like how uh -uh. look. No, okay. not at all. No, I was all about, like, oh, my gosh, I can't fit into my tights, you know? Um, all my clients are going to think I'm fat. Um, so... <laughs> And in this industry, it's easy to do that. If something oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Started, it's oh my so God, it easy just right. to be so... Yeah. Um, so physique oriented, like we're just worried about what we're looking like. Um, so aesthetics, yes. Um, so anyway, um, when I did, so those, so I, I drank tons of water. I didn't eat for about, I fasted for three days and guess what? I lost the 25 pounds and I, I didn't take any more anti-inflammatories because on top of the meloxicam, I would take like, I would say, oh my gosh, I worked out so hard. My muscles are so sore. And I would take like three Advils every night too. You know, so, I mean, I was just like wreaking havoc on my body. So anyway, I lost that 25 pounds and I was fine. Well, that was in December of 2010. Um, and then um, I'd had some things orthopedic where my right hip was like, I was having so much problems. I thought I had a torn labrum and I, you know, so did my orthopedist. I had an MRI done. There was nothing. Um, my right knee was swole, swelled up like twice as big as normal. We thought I had something going on there. Nothing. It was just. Oh, you thought you were having different separate issues going on. Yes. I had all these, all these things going on that were separate. But actually looking back, it was all MS. So in D, uh, I guess it was in um, September of 2011, I went through a um, stressful time. My dad was sick and died real suddenly. Um, and then my son was a teenager and he was very stressful, um, a lot of stress. And um, anyway, Jeff and I, my husband, Jeff, um, had been at the gym working out and he's your husband now, right? Yeah. He's my husband now. And, um, we, um, lifted super heavy. And so, um, when we were lifting that day, I still remember we were doing lap pull downs. And when I finished a set, I was like, wow, that was a tough set. And I was seeing like through a checkerboard, like my eyes, it was just like black and white through a checkerboard and I could see like the black of the checkerboard. And then I could see my vision through the part that would be white on the chessboard. 
And I thought that is so weird. And I felt kind of like faint, but you know, I, I didn't feel like I was going to pass out. So we finished working out and Did I kept you tell your husband that was happening or you just didn't tell him. No, I just, I, I just was like, let me go get some water. And so eventually it like kind of died down and um, he took me um, to my car at my studio because we had driven to the gym together. So he took me to my car at my studio because I needed to go pick our son up from a uh, car line. And when I went to get out of the truck, I opened the truck door and I just fell out. Wow. And so he jumped out immediately. So you just, up. did you just like not feel your legs? You had no, control? like I, I couldn't even stand up. Like I couldn't stand. And so I was sitting on the, on the parking lot. And um, so he came immediately. My left arm was drawing up like almost like, a, you know, now we know it was spasticity that was drawn up and the left side of my face started drawing up. So, so did you he, think you're having a stroke? He, I didn't know what was happening, but he thought I was having a stroke. And um, when he was younger, he, he was in the EMT. He had been a police officer and was trained as an EMT. Okay. So he looked at me and he was like, you know, let me look at you and make sure you're not having a stroke. And I was like, I think it's just my blood sugar's low because I haven't eaten all day. And um, he said, well, I have an energy bar in the truck. So he gave me the energy bar and I ate it and we sat there and I drank some water and I was like, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine. And so, um, you know, he was like, okay, yeah, she's fine. She looks great. So he um, went on and left and I went and picked our son up. So I remember that was on a Thursday and I felt fine the next day. And then on Saturday, I went for like a six mile run. And when I got home, I made a smoothie and I started drinking the smoothie and I sat down on the sofa and I was talking to, to my husband. And then I was like, oh, I'm going to get to the bathroom. And I went to stand up and I couldn't stand up. And then um, I went in, so, so, uh, so when I had the episode on that Thursday, I went about two minutes where I couldn't speak. And so this time again, on that Saturday, I couldn't speak for about four minutes. Were you trying to? You just I was trying to speak. Happen? I couldn't, okay. I couldn't get the words out. And my arm was drawing up again and my face was drawing up. Which totally makes you think stroke all the you Yeah. So, um, so then, you know, he was like, well, maybe she's having many strokes, you know, where I can't really tell by her eyes, but she's having a mini stroke. So one of our, one of my really good friends and clients, her <laughs> husband's my internist. So I called him at home, like on a cell. And I was like, Hey, listen, this happened. And um, so I didn't get him. I left him a message. And so he called me later on that day and he was like, Dolly, I'm so sorry. I didn't get your message. You know, I didn't get your phone call. He said, listen, I want you to come in on Monday and I, I want to check you out. So actually when I went in on that Monday, he already had me scheduled with the neurologist that was in his practice yeah. and for the neurologist to see me. So the neurologist said, you know, I, let's put you on anti-seizure medicine and see if you're having seizures. And so um, they put me on anti-seizure medicine and I kept having the same episodes. So um, that was on a Monday. And so on that Friday, he um, had me have an MRI and then um, MRI of the brain of or? the brain of okay. the brain. Okay. And so um, he, so the way insurance works, Tracy is like, okay, well, let's have this MRI of the brain and of my spine also, because sometimes the MS happens in the spine as well. So, um, and was did, he looking for MS at the time or he, no, didn't, he didn't know what he was looking okay. for. Okay. But um, that was something that maybe he was looking for. So when you have a neuro neurological issue like that, they have to look at a lot of different things and then rule out, rule this out, rule that out. Um, so that was what they did with the seizure medicine. So anyway, um, the way insurance works is I had to go get the MRI and then he had to read it. Then he didn't see anything on it. So let's do an MRI with contrast. So then I had to go do another MRI with contrast. So and, um, and during that time, were you remaining at that weak stage or you'd get your energy back and it would happen again? No, it just kept happening over and over. A roller coaster. Yeah, just okay. every day. And I would be, um, it, it would, be, I would be okay, like early in the day. And then later in the day when I was tired, it would happen. So um, anyway, I got the MRI with contrast. 
he said, sat us down. He said, I think we think you're po you might have MS. Well, actually my doctor called me, my friend, my friend called me and he said, Dolly, um, I want you to sit down. Let me tell you, we think you might have MS. He said, but do me a favor. Do not Google MS. <laughs> so I was like, okay, okay. Did you know anything about MS at that time? No, the only thing I know about MS was um, back in like um, 1989, I was doing long distance cycling, like, you know, riding a hundred mile uh, centuries. And so I signed up to do a um, 150 mile bike ride for MS, but um, I just signed up because I wanted to do the bike ride. Well, I, you I and, and, stuff, yeah. and so um, <clears throat> the people that I was on the team with, one of the men had a wife that had MS and she was like 30 and she was in a wheelchair and couldn't talk. So that's, so when he said, we think you have MS, that was what immediately went into my mind was like, oh my gosh. And, um, so, and they said, you know, you're 47, you're kind of old to be diagnosed with MS. So we're not, we're not saying definitively you do, but we want you to have, um, a spinal tap to rule that out. So I had to have a spinal tap. And a spinal tap, is that where they take fluid out of your spine? They take fluid out of your okay. spine. Okay. Yeah. And so um, anyway, long and short is I was diagnosed with MS. And so now, you know, there's different types of MS. So I have the best MS that you can have, which is relapsing remitting. Um, and so I have relapses. And um, then I'll go into remission and then I'll have relapses and go into remission. And the areas of my brain that it affects is my um, speech, my mobility and my cognitive. And then um, in 2000, so you might notice sometimes with my speech, um, I, like right now, I'm, I say, uh, uh, I stagger my speech. And a lot of people just think that's my Southern speaking. The yeah. Way and with my hearing loss, you, when you pause, it's good for me. It's like, oh, she's so oh, good to hear. Well, that's <laughs> because sometimes with hearing loss, because I don't know if you guys know who's listening, I wear hearing aids and the left ear, I'm almost deaf. And so sometimes it's like they're finishing a sentence and they're on a step else. I'm still processing this before they go. Right. I don't have, I don't do that with everybody. It all depends right. on the person and how they talk. So I just figured you just talk, you know, naturally at that speed mm -hmm. and your accent and I don't notice anything wrong or anything okay. not wrong, but right. anything. No. Yeah. It's just, the, it's just the way I talk. So everybody that um, is around me all the time is just used to me talking mm -hmm. uh, staggered. Uh, that's what I call it is staggered. Um, but anyway, um, then in 2012, so I was diagnosed in September of 2011. And then in May of 2012, when I had um, another brain MRI, a, a lesion showed up on my occipital lobe. So um, your occipital lobe controls your um, your sight um, and your like your ability to um, your depth perception, like spatial awareness, and spatial awareness, and your ability to see colors. Oh. And um, so, and I also have um, ocular neuritis in my left eye. So sometimes, if I'm tired, I won't be able to see very well out of my left eye because the ocular nerve is overstretched. So the, so those were the three things they looked at uh, for MS was um, ocular neuritis. Did you have that? Do you have that? Do you have lesions that show up, plaques that show up on the MRI in the brain or in the spine? And um, what was the third one? The spinal tap. So the spinal tap was the third um, way that they were able to definitively diagnose that I had MS. Um, so in 2012, when I had the lesion on my occipital lobe, that really frightened me because I have a friend that has MS and it affects her sight. And sometimes she is blind for a period of time when she does it cause pain in your eye sockets or anything. Do you she feel doesn't it? have any pain. Uh, -uh just, to, just her, her vision becomes very dim. Okay. Um, so I really, that, uh, that was very frightening to me to lose my sight. Oh, yeah. And so, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Montel Williams. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. So he has MS and, um, he juices all the time. And so, um, I was just right when I had that MRI and I was told that I had that, um, lesion on my occipital lobe, I happened to see 
an infomercial with Montel Williams juicing. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to juice and see if it makes a difference. So um, I started juicing at the end of May in 2012. And I juiced until my follow-up um, MRI to, um, you know, check and see if I, if it had progressed worse in August. And when we went in to see my neurologist, he said, what have you been doing? And yeah. I said, well, I've been juicing. And so I was just doing a plant-based protein and I was only having vegetables, like juiced vegetables. I wasn't eating any food at all. You went kind of plant-based. Um, yeah. It was garden of life, okay. garden of life protein. Um, and uh, anyway, he said, the lesion on your occipital lobe is gone. Wow. It's just like, chill. How awesome. I know. So it never came back. And about that same time, I had a client um, who is a um, occupational therapist. So she works with people with MS. She told me about um, Dr. Terry Wall, who has MS. And she wrote the book, Minding My Mitochondria. And so she believed in brain, um, brain nutrition. And so um, she since has changed the name of the book because it's not very sexy, Minding My Mitochondria. Who's going <laughs> to read that, right? <laughs> Nobody. So now it's called The Walls Protocol. And um, so her uh, nutrition plan um, is uh, based on um, eating 35 different plants a week. Um, and eating red meat and um, cold water fish um, and bone marrow. So I never did the bone marrow because I was like, I just can't really do that. I'm sorry. Um, so to all you keto people out there, I hope you're not offended, but um, bone marrow, just no, I'm not going to do that. But um, so I had not had any steak at that point for probably 15 years. And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to eat some red meat because I <laughs> it was chicken and fish and eggs um, before that. And um, so anyway, her theory was that we needed the creatine from the red meat for our brain. Our brain needed the creatine. So it was crazy that, you know, like when you're pregnant, um, they say that you're, you crave the foods that your body needs. Um, and which is why women have cravings when they're pregnant. And when I... The instant I started eating red meat, I just wanted it. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, let's have a steak tonight. And my husband like, oh, score, right? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, she never eats steak. <laughs> but um, so anyway, um, so I still follow that protocol. So when I talked about earlier with my boot camps, where I really wasn't very healthy as far as the way I ate. I mean, I and were you taking creatine supplements when you were a bodybuilder, like a lot of people did? I did. Yes, I did. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Um, and, uh, I wonder, was, do you think that delayed you getting diagnosed later? Well, you'll never know. I'll yeah. never know. I don't, yeah. I'll never know. Um, I just, I, I think that maybe it would have been lying dormant. Um, and that the, the dispersants from the oil spill, um, pulled it out because when, um, so when the oil spill happened, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't connect that because I got off on a tangent, but um, no, not a tangent. You're sharing your story. There's a lot of it, details to it. When the oil spill happened here, we had um, a researcher that had um, been uh, worked in Alaska with the Alaska uh, with Exxon Valdez uh, mm -hmm. when it, when they had that terrible oil spill there, yeah. and that um, people in that region had brain lesions, and that the animals had brain lesions from the oil, mm -hmm. and so. There's no way that we could prove it that my MS came out because of the oil spill. But I mean, I don't know. To be diagnosed at 47 yeah. and not have had any sim real symptoms. I mean, I might have had symptoms. Uh, maybe I don't. I don't really remember any time that I might have had symptoms before then. So, um, you know, it's just kind of coincidental that maybe it all came out within the within 12 yeah. months. You know. So um, anyway, um, the Walls Protocol uh, way of eating totally changed my view of nutrition and my approach to nutrition and also my approach with my clients to nutrition. And um, because I, 
because of bodybuilding, I ate such a linear diet. I ate the same thing yeah. all every day for 15 years or 20 years. Um, and, um, uh, you know, it was all about having that ripped up six pack and, uh, having your super low body fat. And I mean, it's just, uh, it wreaked havoc on my metabolism. So when I first started eating like healthy, my body was like, oh my gosh, the famine is over and we need to store some of this fat, you know, store fat so that. Yeah. Cause she may when, do it again. When the famine happens again, because yeah. our bodies on a base level don't know that we live in America and we have, you know, food, even if we're, even if we don't have any money to buy food, we can get food, you yeah. know? Um, so, um, anyway, so I gained some weight and I just was like, you know, I'm just going to have to deal with it. Like, I'm just going to have to not worry about it. I'm within healthy body fat ranges and that's, that's what matters. And so that it kind of changed, it was a paradigm shift for me, uh, personally and also professionally with my clients where, you know, it's like, it's okay that you're like 24% body fat because you're healthy because that's healthy body fat ranges. It's okay. You know, that we got a little bit of extra fluff on our apps or whatever. And, um, so that to me, like, you know, people, they don't do it so much anymore because I don't have people come up to me and say, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. You're sick. I'm so, I'm like, I'm not sick. I have MS. I'm not, I have a neurological issue. I'm not sick, you know, um, or you look so good. You don't look like you're sick. And I'm like, well, I'm not sick. I just have a neurological issue yeah. um, and I'm managing it. But, um, you know, the good thing is, is that my doctor, uh, I was taken off. I was taken, I was in the MS. We don't have medicine. It's called disease modifying therapy. Okay. So there's no medicine because there is no cure for MS. There's no medicine that's going to cure me. I just have therapy that's going to help. Um, so what I took was um, I had an injection that helped uh, with my uh, my T cells to produce um, good T cells that wouldn't attack my T cells. So my bad T cells were attacking my T cells. And so it, it, the medicine that was taken produced good T cells to um, get rid of the bad T cells. But in 2022, I started having an anaphylactic reaction to it. So um, I was really bad allergic reaction. And so wow. my doctor um, said, you know, Dolly, your MRIs since 2012 have been totally clear. Why don't we just try not being on any kind of disease modifying therapy? Because she said that since I was finished with menopause, that my hormones had calmed down and that my immune system um, would calm down also. Because the problem with a lot of times autoimmune is that you want to be careful with people with autoimmune because they might be taking something to suppress their immune system. But I've never taken anything to suppress my immune system. I just took something to kind of control my immune system. But she said, your immune system's calmed down now that you're done with um, menopause and it's called immunosenescence. Have you ever heard of that? I have heard of that. And so um, I had never really heard of it. And she explained to me that with age, your immune system calms down. And so it's not attacking itself anymore. And so let's go off of off of any kind of disease modifying therapy and see how you are. But the kicker that she said to me was people like you that have MS that have relapsing remitting. Now, progressive MS is different, Tracy. So, so I, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't, I don't know that um, immunosenescence would help with that um, because it's a progressive disease, but um, relapsing remitting MS, she said, because you've always lived a healthy lifestyle and you're so active and you eat a healthy nutrition that you're probably not going to progress any further with, which this, um, this is not the neurologist that I originally had. The neurologist I originally had told me I needed to quit exercising. I could only do yoga and water aerobics that probably by the time I was 70, I'd be in a wheelchair. Oh, awful. So when I went to get a second opinion, 
um, my, the neurologist I have now, she's in Birmingham, which is four hours away from me. So I went to her when I was initially diagnosed to get a second opinion. And she said, yes, you do have MS. And I said, well, what about exercise? I mean, do I have to stop exercising? And she said, no, you keep doing whatever it is that you like to do. If it makes you feel bad, then don't do it. But otherwise just keep doing it. And she was like, you're going to be fine. You figure it out. It's going to be fine. And that was what I needed to hear because I was so depressed because I was a half, I, I never ran marathons, but I was a triathlete. I ran half marathons. Um, I ran 10 Ks. I ran five Ks. I did all my boot camps that I love to do. And I just thought, oh my gosh, my life is over. Yeah. And, um, and little did I know that um, about six or eight years later, I would have the epiphany that like, oh, you know what? All this running and stuff isn't really good for your joints. Maybe you need to quit doing that too. Um, but anyway, it was something that I enjoyed doing and um, I don't do it anymore. I don't do any of those kind of competitions anymore, but not because of MS, but because of age, <laughs> just, just because yeah. I want to be able to walk um, yeah. when I'm 80, you know? Yeah. So I decided I just needed to quit putting that kind of stress on my body. So I know I've taken a whole bunch of time talking about MS. But that's what I wanted, wanted to show you. I didn't know. I know part of your story just a little bit. But I didn't ever knew all that. I didn't know. And I, I know there are different forms of MS, but I didn't really know. I don't really know the main the specifics. I've trained probably five or six people who's had MS. When uh -huh. I was in college, for my fitness specialist program, the main teacher owned a gym in Newport Beach. And um, because I was in Huntington Beach at the time, and he we'd go there and work. He, we'd, he let us go there as we're in school and just, you know, learn how the gym runs and what to do. And the first client he had me train was a woman with MS. And uh -huh. there. She could only train for 10 minutes with me. I don't think I ever heard of MS before that day. And I remember her standing up from the wheelchair and she was doing the, the tricep pull downs with the rope uh -huh. he said that's it she worked out for 10 minutes she's fine and um yeah it was just interesting but it made me learn more but I never learned like I didn't like take a specialty program but I had this guy who has MS and he was in his 60s he's still in Oregon with Sabi my dog well, Sabi's up there loved him they were like buddies he'd come work out but he went to Portland Oregon and had um he was a part of a study. And so, you know, like people sit and get chemo and the chemo ran through him. He went uh -huh. every three months and had something that they ran through him like that. So an infusion. It worked so good for him. Yeah. They, yeah. Whatever they did in the first session, the next two weeks, he was doing battle rope stronger. He was more balanced. He spoke mm -hmm. clearer. Then he went back, they upped the medicine and he did worse. And I oh. couldn't understand, well, why don't they just go back to your first dose? Because you did well. I didn't know how it worked. I'm like, just tell the doctors you did good that one dose. But he was just, you know, I had no say so in it. But I really just wanted, I was so excited that he was like getting better. But I don't know if it was just a temporary thing or I, I don't know. Yeah. But I watched him go up and down, decline. And some, I saw him in his brain fogs. And I had, a, I had another client with it who, they're, they're just all different. Just like the stroke service, they're all different. So what worked for one didn't work for this one. Right. And Yeah. So that's the thing about MS that um, is very challenge can be very challenging for people that do work with individuals with MS is because it's just dependent upon where the lesions are located in the brain. That's like when I worked with soap survivors, it depends where the brain injury is. It's yeah. different. It could be like a quarter of an inch that way in their brain and they're completely different than the person next to them. Right. Just, right. Yeah. And then, um, so what, another interesting thing about um the neuroscience of MS is that um, MRI, like newer MRIs have shown that uh, the brain can bypass those areas where the myelin sheath is, um, is damaged, um, that the, the brain will actually bypass, will teach itself to bypass like to make new that area. So yeah. um, that's what my neurologist seems to think happened with me because I practiced yoga for so many years and also Pilates for so many years, the mind body um, and where I was doing instruction all the time where so I had to have perfect form. So I was always um, 
talking myself through the perfect form. She just felt like that I might have retrained areas of my brain so that my mobility is really good. Um, so yeah. So, um, so um, her name is Emily Riser, Dr. Emily Riser. Um, she and her husband, Dr. John Riser, have a clinic in Birmingham, Alabama, and she specializes in MS and he specializes in Parkinson's. That's another thing that um, people with MS or Parkinson's, if you can get with a doctor that specializes in MS or in Parkinson's, then they um, have more time to spend with you than if you go to just a general neurologist, because, um, and I don't mean this in a bad way, uh, but I had a neurologist um, tell me, uh, he, he specialized in MS, but he was with a neurology practice. And he said that it's all about the bottom line and that a neurologist that treats migraines can see a lot more patients in one day than a neurologist that treats people with MS. Because with the MS, you have to spend a lot more time. So um, so the the Tanner Center for MS um, that's in Birmingham, they um, are able to spend specific time, like a, they have specific time set aside to spend with each patient where they're not just running through a meal. So, um, so I do fundraising for the Tanner Center. In fact, um, Fit Tour um, Giving Tuesday at Thanksgiving actually donated um, all of their 100% of their sales to the Tanner Center on my behalf. Oh, that's awesome. Um, last Thanksgiving. Yeah. So, Very cool. um, yeah. And so I worked um, on an MS research project with Dr. Emily. Um, and she, uh, so I just, you know, sometimes I think things happen for a reason. Mm -hmm. And if I hadn't been diagnosed with MS, I never would have met Dr. Emily. And she's turned out to be a friend. Um, and then uh, if I hadn't met Dr. Emily, I wouldn't have gotten involved with University of Alabama, Birmingham and the Lakeshore Collaborative to work on a study um, for that compared um, direct exercise where patients were coming into the clinic and exercising and tele rehab uh, or tele exercise for people with MS. And um, so the, the goal there was to have a home program for individuals with MS in Alabama, Mississippi, and Tennessee, because we have a lot of rural areas um, in all the states where there is no clinic for individuals with MS to go to, um, to get um, exercise. And the problem, you could say, well, you could just do it over the internet, but the problem is that a lot of those rural areas don't have internet access. And wow. so um, what we did was we put, and, and a lot of times when you have the MS programming, um, it is not based on level of function. So we we added in um, with this study, we were able to add in level of function where we could test people for their level of function. And we had four different levels um, where they would be able to exercise. And so um, it was a neat grant study that was, um, was awarded through Patient Centered Outcome Research Institute, it's PCORI. And um, so what they do is they have patients um, that are on the research team, caregivers, and also um, like um, medical staff. So on the research team, I was um, the exercise specialist, and we had another person who was an MS nurse who had MS, and then we had a caretaker or caregiver, um, not caretaker, but caregiver. <laughs> On the, um, on the panel. We had uh, a few patients on the panel also. And so um, what, what, what they try to do is what, what my daughter tries to do is she tries to take into account how patients feel, how the care, feel, caregivers, you know, take them into consideration instead of just telling us, this is what you have to do. This is, you know, so, um, so it was really neat that we had those different levels because I've had so many people over the years um meaning well-meaning friends um give me like uh dvds when we used to use dvds um or books of like here's exercise for somebody with ms and i'd be like my level of function is so much higher than that like uh, that wouldn't that would take me backwards to do yeah. yeah so um so it was really exciting to help them develop 
the programming for the, all the different levels of function from somebody in do a wheelchair. So, um, so what happened is um, the, the research project was granted for four years. Um, and then because of um, COVID, then um, we got an extension on that. And um, so what happened with COVID, which, you know, it was a terrible thing shutting down and everything. But what happened was that this kind of morphed into um, being able to supply people with virtual training at home um, on their own tablet. So um, the the study is over now um, and um, I'm actually published uh NIH through the National Institutes of Health. I have an article published with me as an author. Nice. Um, so I'm really excited. That was, I was super excited. I was like, woohoo, I've done all these <laughs> things for a fit tour, yeah. like taking all these courses. But to be able to be published in the National Institutes of Health and then also to be able to be invited to be a presenter at the um, Pecori Annual Meeting um, 2019 in the plenary um session, which the plenary session is the session that everybody goes to. Um, it's not just a breakout session. So um, I got to present in Washington, D.C. Uh, about the research that we had done. And that's the, awesome. And um, yeah. patient engagement, um, which was a big thing. Yeah. So, um, anyway, that was very exciting to be able to do that. But if I hadn't met Dr. Emily, you know, because I had MS, I wouldn't have been able to yeah. do that. Um, and, and I feel like, made, yeah, you made the best of what you had too. Absolutely. And it must just kind of help me um, on a personal level, um, become a more empathetic person, uh, more empathetic with my clients, um, more. And, and it sounds like you're more empathetic with yourself too. Oh, much more, much more. I used to be very, um, very hard on myself. Um, and, uh, you know, I think a lot of, um, uh, fitness professionals have like eating disorders and body dysmorphia. I mean, would you agree with that? <laughs> yes. Um, and so oh, you know, yeah, there, there's a range of, well, especially now in the social media being so, I mean, there's apps that can make your waist look smaller. I mean, I remember going, I think was, I didn't go to idea last year because my spine injury and oh, yeah, still dealing with that. It's way better, but it was oh, awful. Anyway, but at the the one in Vegas, you didn't go to the one in Vegas year before. Okay. No, I didn't go. Someone in the industry and I was like, it was the year that I was, I, I got personal training the year the year before and I was going on stage to present, to give the award to the next person. And I felt the worst about my body ever in my life because with everything I've gone through um, and losing my stepdad, my dad, my dog and everything and all the stress going on that I went through. I put on weight and I've never been like 20 or 30 pounds of weight in my life. Right. I'd have to get in stage. And I'm just the, the one of the goals I want, I have to get in stage looking the worst that I've ever felt in my life. And I remember, and I was tired and just, just, I just felt haggard. By you me. were going through, I remember that you were going through so oh, much at that time. So much. And then, you know, some of the other stuff that went down there too, that was just right. so stress. I was, yes. we talked on the phone. I think I was crying when mm -hmm. I was an idea. Um, but I remember someone in the industry came up to me and one of the men, and says, oh, you, you, I, you, you, you look young, um, younger in person. I thought, I think he wanted to say the opposite. <laughs> I think he wanted to say, you look like crap. You look better yeah. on social media. He kind of just was him hawing. And I just want to say, hey, I'm tired. I've been through hell. Stop checking right. me look. But he made those comments and I just thought, hmm, whatever. Yeah. But it made me feel so like, and then also when I was, I did the um, LA Times book festival last April mm -hmm. and I had a booth there and I had my, you know, all my books and, and people obviously came to me who read my books or know about stroke, you know, that, that's what gathers to me. And someone in the fitness industry I never went before, met before came up to me, her husband had a stroke and she was his full-time caregiver. I mean, he was really bad where she could almost not leave the house. She's mm -hmm. put on weight as well and she was crying and she said you know I'm embarrassed because of what I do for a living but this is where my life is right now but she, I we related in our stories because you you know you kind of have to have this not that you want to have this image but you you have to look what you part right. but also we're human beings and we're you know we're in our 40s and 50s and we have the hormones we're challenging there's so many things going on at once 
at that mm -hmm. time. And she and, and we connected a lot. Of, and she was just an example of, I'm embarrassed. It's what I do for a living. And I think people look down on me. And and I it's sad that that happens because we put pressure on ourselves because we, we think we have to look that way all the time. And sometimes we just don't. And I think people, if you say stuff, you have the people say, well, it's just excuses. You can do it. You can do it. It's like, it's not an excuse. Sometimes we have reasons. It's not a naivety excuse. It's just be kind to people. That's my thing. Just be kind to people. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, I think though, um, you know, as, as fitness professionals, cause we you always tell myself and my clients that we all have seasons that we go through and, you know, not, and to give ourselves grace, if we're going through a bad season, like I just, my um, husband had a shoulder replacement um, last April and um, it turned out to be, um, he had to have a reverse shoulder, which I won't go into all the detail of that, but it, it's not the same. His shoulder is not the same. And it was a lot more extensive surgery. He had to have a lot of bone removed. And so that caused a lot of pain. Oh, they're and, painful um, and you can't lay down and sleep positions, shoulder stuff. Just yeah. So, and any, anybody that uh, knows me or follows me has seen pictures of my husband. He's very, um, muscular, very fit, very healthy. And, um, he's been that way his whole life. And, um, you know, he had a, that shoulder placement at 75 and he just turned 76 about two weeks ago, but it was a life changer for him. And, um, you know, when we go through those kind of health, um, issues where our health goes down, our function goes down. Um, sometimes it's really challenging for us to pull ourselves back up out of it. And, um, you know, I just recently wrote the active aging course for fit tour. Um, and, and it, you know, in, in that we do explore that, um, it, that when, as we get older, we're going to go through stages where our function declines, um, and then just natural aging process, um, that we lose muscle just naturally. We gain body fat just naturally. I mean, it's, it's not, there's no magic pill that's going to keep it from happening. Yeah, and, but, can't stop and, aging. Uh, I, I'm sorry, what? We can't stop aging. No, we can't. And so, um, you know, for me, um, writing that course, um, and I was finishing up the course as he was finishing up writing the course as he was, um, rehab, as I was helping him rehab. And, um, for me, it just helped me to be able to say, you know, it's okay. We're getting older. It's okay that we're getting older. It's getting, uh, it's okay that we don't look like, uh, you know, muscle and fitness anymore that, that, we're, but just, that we're just healthy and happy. And we can, we have a high level of function where we are right now. And, and we're happy with what we've got and, and give ourselves grace. But, you know, um, I think like with my clients, um, a lot of them uh, relay to me that me just being real is what makes them love training with me. It, me just being authentic and saying, oh my gosh, y'all, you know, uh, over the past like three months, I've gained about five pounds and, you know, I'm just having the hardest time getting it off and I just, I need to like maybe walk a little bit more or maybe just be happy with that extra little five pounds or whatever, you know? Um, that's been hard for me. It's been hard for me. I walk by, it's very I walk by a mirror. I see pictures. Of, God, that's not me. But I'm also 58 and it's different than when you're 20. Oh, definitely. So girl, I, I'm going to be 60 in like three weeks. Oh, are you? Okay. Four weeks. Yeah. Four weeks. Four weeks. Five weeks. Five weeks. At the end of March, I'll be 60. And, you know, um, I don't have my ripped up six pack anymore. Well, I still kind of have it, but it's got all this skin on it that doesn't really need to be seen outside of a tankini, you know? And I look back at pictures and I'm like, oh my gosh, look at how good I look. And then I'm then okay, so I'm like, why can't I look like that? I gotta work harder. I need to yeah, work it goes through and, your head. Yeah. And, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, when that picture was made. I was 45. I was 15 years younger. Yeah. And and so in my mind, I'm thinking 45 is not that much younger than 60. But when I was 45, what did 60 look like to me? Yeah, it seemed like so right? far away. It seemed like forever. And then, you know, women, like as women, we should build each other up. Yeah. And I had a, um, an, a, an incident with my GYN 
when I was at um, my um, annual checkup, I guess it was about four, yeah, it was four years ago since so I was 56. And I was still wearing bikinis at 56. And um, as she was checking me, you know, she was pushing my belly and stuff. And she said, you know, we have like a laser treatment. We could do something with your skin on your tummy. And I said, oh, so, you know, I was just kind of like, oh, you're judging my tummy. <laughs> well, I didn't really say anything at the time, but in my head that that part of me that has body dysmorphia, because I was like, oh, I, you know, I didn't think there was anything wrong with my tummy. But then all of a sudden, after she said that, yeah. I was like, oh, my gosh, look at the skin on my tummy. Look at, oh, my gosh, Jeff, look at the skin on my stomach. Oh, my gosh, it's all like, it's kind of, you know, stretched out. Look at it. And he was like, yeah, you're 56. It's stretched out. I noticed it like four years ago. Like, it, you know, it's been happening. Like wow. it's, it's not a big deal, but it made me so self-conscious. And, you know, I thought to myself then, I hope I never say something like that to one of my clients to make them feel wow. that insecure about themselves, you know, because I felt really good about myself walking into that appointment. And then when I yeah. left, I felt terrible. And it wasn't that she intentionally did it. She was just trying to sell me a service. And, you know, I just, I think sometimes we need to like engage our brain before we say something. Yeah. I think you never said anything like that to a client because you wouldn't. I just can't see that. Well, I hope I haven't like unknowingly oh, like true, yeah. said anything like, you know, un not consciously saying. Yeah. Something. God, I hope I never did either. Um, yeah. yeah. So, but you know, that's something as women, we really re need to realize that we need to like be kind to each other and totally. and not be so about our appearance driven. And don't be jealous of your friends or women that maybe get something that you didn't or you know, like when I get my book awards, I don't think anyone acknowledges them. You know, some people. Oh, girl, I'm that way so excited for you. Oh, Every time I see you get a book award. I mean, actually, I was um, before we even set up for me to be on your podcast last week, I was talking about you to some of my friends oh, about how you. amazing you were thank and you. Um, how much you've accomplished. Um, but my in world has changed since I've won awards. You know, I got the idea award before, mm -hmm. before that. I got the, the second place in the medical fitness award with the um Med Fitness Foundation. I just the uh, just shocked of so many women that say, Oh, support people, support people. It's like, do you know what support is? <laughs> because yeah. telling someone I should have the award won the award, not you, is not supporting a woman. I right. mean, the things people have said, I'm like, wow. And I'm, you know, all that going on. You know, because I think I was here, well, I'm in California now. I was living in Oregon, but I came to California and I was doing this thing with MedFit, Med Fitness Foundation at Irvine Spectrum. I right. mean, uh, UC Irvine and my dad was here. So I visited him and all the things. That was, that was like February, 2020 when COVID was there. We didn't know what COVID was. I'm on the plane going, what's this people wearing masks? I didn't know, <laughs> no idea what was going on. It was the beginning of it. And, um, and then during COVID is when I won different awards when I won the and I got the idea award everything was during Zoom was, everything was just different but it's all like during the sad I think Lee passed away I won I was up for an award and I had mm -hmm. to say something and he just passed away like I, within a week before and then when I got the award the next year I think Wasabi just passed like within a week before and I was just like oh my god I know and you just yeah. and you were taking care of your mom. This. Yeah. But, you know, when I when I did the inter my previous interview with Peter Twist, he said something. He said, and I like that he said this. He said, in life, we can have sadness at the same time we have joy. And just the awesome. way you word, I thought, oh, that's a really good thing to say. Because it's hard to mm -hmm. be So that. I remember that though, when you got that award. And I remember um just thinking. Well, Tracy's dad and stepdad would be so proud of her, you know, um, and just, you know, it, we focus on that, like our parents, like my, both of my parents are gone. Um, and I just think, wow, you know, my parents will be so proud of me of all the things I've done, you know? Yeah. I, I mean, I think that we can I have one friend that will text me sometimes like, you're, 
dad would have been proud of you for that. Like, thank you. <laughs> yeah, but he would have been, Tracy. Yeah. Not, I mean, look at all the books you've published since the, yeah. the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, it's and amazing. I, did it. I look back, I published a book, a really short book. So I had a, like way back in my, my 20s. So I, so I didn't grow up with a lot of, um, feeding me positivity or trying to help me have, you know, self-confidence. Uh, my mom wasn't there. She lived someplace else. Well, she, I would see her on weekends, but I lived with my dad and my brothers. And it's like, if I put eyeshadow on or something, when he got that on, I mean, and <laughs> like, heard me. so I remember when I was 21, I was, I can't remember what happened. And I worked at a hair salon and or maybe a little, a little, a little younger than 21. I was working at a hair salon. So I did hair through cosmetology school. I got my license. I was doing hair in hair salon. And the guy I was assisting said, you know, why don't you see the counselor at my church? I think you need to some help getting through this sad thing or anything. So I did. And the lady looked at me and she said, okay, I want you to write down 10 things you like about yourself. That was like a foreign language to me. I go, I don't understand. She was, well, you have pretty eyelids or she would be eyelashes. She would tell me something like, we're allowed to think that stuff about ourselves. So I was right. just falling and she was telling me things. You have pretty hair. You have nice green eyes. And I'm like, no, so I went to counseling for a while, and so I had a journal where I'd write positive things about myself. So anything negative said to me, it was just drowned out by me reading it. So I read it like every day, just little positive things every page. And I told myself, one day I'm going to publish this. It was pretty much like, here's an image, here's a positive thing. Kind of like now when you scroll through social media, you see, right. this, well, I made one of my own, and I still had it. And when my mom had cancer, she got diagnosed with cancer last year in October. Well, she got diagnosed on my birthday, November 9th, but she told me the day after. And um, we were, you know, she was getting through tests. And they finally figured it out. And so that's one story. But at that, somewhere in that point, right before I think I said, I'm going to publish that now. But basically just get an image, one liner, give it. So it was a really easy thing to do. But I look back, I published that book 11 days before my mom died. From my cell phone at home. It's like, I don't know how I did it. I have it blocked out. I think it was just coping. I know, girl. Man, but I'm like, that was weird. That doesn't sound right. I thought, why did I do that? But I think I was, I don't know. Some person, I, I don't know. I did it. and I. But maybe you just needed to do it for yourself. I think I did. Yeah. Because I don't even think that book has sold any copies. It's something of mine. Because I said 40 years ago, I'm going to put in a book one day. I thought, okay, I'm going to do it. And then I did it. And I looked back and I went, wow. Well, <laughs> you, you need to put... Put that book on social media, girl. I don't even remember hearing about it. <laughs> because it faded away with my mom's stuff. Um, yeah, my my mom was always the first person to go and do a review for me on Amazon. Uh -huh. So she did it. She was able to do it. She was able to get to her computer sometimes. So, but it's going to be weird in a published in desk book, not having her here to do that. It's just yeah. A part of the thing, but yeah. So I've got a few of your books and I love them. Thank you. I know you yeah. helped me with them. You did my reviews. You helped me review courses. I'm like, she needs to be on her. She's helped me so much. I had to bring her and do something for her. <laughs> well, I just love talking to you, Tracy. Every time we talk, I just love it. You're just... I remember that when we met, Robert was still here. Robert from Fit Tour. Yes. Um, he was so sweet and so cute. He was. I only met him a couple of times, but he was funny. And we didn't, we always had so much fun at those dinners. I've only did a few of them because I was a fit tour master trainer for a few years. And I did some, I did, I think, a personal training live course and a few plotty ones. But then they start doing them online. They don't come back. And then COVID hit. Right. And I don't do it anymore. I know. That was fun. I love teaching live courses. I know. I miss it. It just seems like um, people don't want to do live courses anymore. Yeah. They just want to do, uh, and I totally understand because I'm real limited in my time too. We've got yeah. four grandkids and um, we're going all the time and I'm running my studio and, um, you know, it's just uh, for time management, it's real easy just to get online and do it. But I do I miss the interaction and, um, yeah. And I used to love the travel and meet people all over the country. Wow. And um, it was so much fun. And um, I just gotten where like going to idea, I wish, you know, idea would do things maybe not on the West coast every year, but I understand that that's where their, uh, yeah. their headquarters are. So it's easier for them to do it there. Um, but it's hard to get to travel from Alabama out to the West coast well, it's expensive because you have to have a hotel. And I'm like, oh, it's in LA this year. And I'm in Long Beach. Oh, I can't <laughs> tell my back hurts. I'm like, oh my God. Because I, I hated it. 
I hated yeah. you to present last summer. And they, and they set my, my session with me like at four in the afternoon. And with that back pain and what I was going through, I was by four in the afternoon. I'm like, okay, I'm out of it. I mean, right. it's just, I would have, it's just pain exhausts you. And it's just, it's a lot, mm -hmm. but okay. Before we finish up, I know we're over an hour, but, um, and I forgot the name of the magazine. I was in it. You're in, you're in it several times. The fitness magazine. I, um, um, PFP, personal fitness professional. Yes. I'm yes. like, God, I couldn't remember yes. this word. I couldn't find my copies. I'm like, I have to ask her about that. So um, what I'll share a short story then and, and I'll ask you. So when my stepfather was diagnosed with, um, he was diagnosed with bone cancer. And that was around the time, I think Jane, Greg Justice said, you know, they wanted to do an article with you. I think he told them about me and the article was going to come out, but I couldn't, my stepdad was the person that took my photos for me. Uh -huh. And he barely lift his body off the couch. So my mom was trying to do it with my cell phone in the backyard. And it was raining. It was COVID. So I, it was heavy COVID time. I couldn't even get the photographer I knew in town to come. Um, and my stepdad wanted to see the article so badly. And I know they wanted, they were like, well, why don't we just postpone it so things are better? I'm like, no, I have to do it. And I felt like, oh my God, I think they're mad at me. I was like, no, just use the photos I have because I wanted my stepdad to see the article mm -hmm. so badly before he passed away and he got to but he was already kind of out of it and he's like I can't really read. He, he couldn't read anymore and he wouldn't tell me oh. but, you know but I was so grateful that they got it out even mm -hmm. though if you look at the photos it's not I don't think it was the quality of photos they wanted for the magazine but they did it for me it was so nice I don't think I I don't even know if I even told him I stepped in had bone cancer I wanted I, I want him to see it I don't even remember because he was the first parent to get sick and it was right. shocking to me and he was the one that he always walked and took care of himself. So when I started meeting clients at 80, I'm like, oh, you guys are long, young. I have clients that are 105. Mm -hmm. And I thought he would outlive everybody. But he went first. And I was like, well, that's, that's no, my God. But um, so I just wanted him to see the article. But you're involved with them a lot, right? Uh, with PFP? Yeah. I am like with Fit Tour. Yes. So um, Fit Tour, um, they um, do um, like webinars, you know, uh, for PFP. And oh, okay. um, so I did a webinar, I think in November for PFP. And, you know, the webinars for um, PFP are recorded and you can always just go to their website and um, just look through the different webinars and click on them and watch them. Um, so I did um, a webinar for PFP, I think in November on Fit Tour's new active aging course. And we just talked about that okay. and um, what's what it what is all in it and um then um in 2020 i was um selected as um pfp trainer of the month yes i remember October. That. okay remember yeah that. and so um you know i applied to be tra uh, trainer of the year that year but wow that the um the people that had been uh trainers of the month for that year were amazing um i think a uh, yeah, as you are too. I, yeah. Well, I mean, I thought it was amazing. I thought my story was great with the, with all the MS research and everything. Um, and uh, but there was um a trainer from, gosh, maybe India that has done like this amazing work in obesity, um, in that country. Um, I think it was India, but I'm not exactly sure. Um, but he was amazing. He, he, um, he won. Um, cause I thought Meredith Batolis, are you familiar with her? I heard the um, name. Yes. Her story was really good too. Um, but I mean, I just felt so honored just to be like in the running with, with the people that were, um, that had been trainers of the month for that year. It was, um, really impressive, um, so if, if people don't follow PFP, they might want to, it's, um, personal fitness professional PFP and, um, they, um, uh, they have great articles they have, um, and it's, they always have articles on like nutrition in every one of their magazines. There'll be a business article, um, an article on nutrition, an article on different types of workouts. They'll have, um, somebody that they highlight a trainer that they highlight, um, and so Tracy, I like that one. I would highlight one. That's what I want to do. Yeah. 
Yeah. It was so a really were, lovely article they did. Yeah. I just wanted my stepdad to see it so badly. And he did. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, and yeah. so, uh, yeah, I love PFP. They're really easy to work with, but I've never like with my own, with my own work, I've never done anything with them. I just always did work with them with fit tour. Oh, okay. Um, and, and the uh, magazine's not in print anymore, right? It's all digital. No, I still get it. I still I get it get at my mailbox. Anymore. I don't get it. I don't know why. Oh, so you know what? You need to go into your account and say that you want to get the print. Okay. Uh, because and I, I used to, but a few times yeah. I had to go in and recheck again. Yeah. So I just thought they, they stopped. Um, I think they sent me something to update, but because okay. I because of my MS, I do I can read things online and on the computer. Um, but I do better if I have a uh, paper that I can read and hold and I can flip through and go back and read. I hate um, reading stuff so online. That's one thing where the um, online study is challenging for me. Me too. Um, very challenging. Unless there are a lot of talk. Like when I did all my things years ago with Paul Chess and the Czech Institute, when we mm -hmm. did it digitally, it was just like, and, and the Fit Tour ones, easy because you're not going a three minute video, three minute video, three minute video. It's like you just got to watch it. And you switch right. things, but you don't have you, fit tour. I have done every single certification they've had. I haven't been renewing them. Good I've, for you, Tracy. Yeah, every single one I've done. And um, since 2002. So when you said you started in 2002, I found them in 2002, I think. And I did one of their yoga things. Oh, and then yeah. when I was married, I started doing more like in 2006, I think. And that's when I started doing the Pilates, which was a great course. Mm -hmm. and I just kept doing them. And then doing, yeah. it. I think your first one I saw you on was the core one or the ball. I think um, I did with so, you. Yeah. So, the ball. Um, no, you had the ball, the bar, a whole bunch of them. I did them all. I, was it the uh, group barbell probably? I did the group barbell. Yeah. I did, and I, I did all of them. Yeah. I, I've done, I've done a lot of their videos. Um, yeah. And then I think I've written maybe... 10 or 11 courses for fit. And they're good courses. They're on the ball. They're the, they're easy to learn with. Cause mm -hmm. sometimes, sometimes people's courses are so fancy or, you know, they have music in the background. It's just like a, and it's like, it's too much for me. And I always want to print the manuals. I mm -hmm. hate reading them online. I want them in my hand. Even when I proofread my books, I I do what I can and then I print them and read them on paper to make my thing because I just right. hate reading on the computer. Right. Unless I have to, or on my phone. Yeah. So and just, so with the Fit Tour courses, what we try to do is we try to get a lot of different research. So we don't have just one um one uh research project or one research thing that we're looking at. We try to get a research from a lot of different things, like with the um with the senior fitness, um, what, it, what is it called? A fit tour calls it active aging specialist. Um, so I researched, uh, I went through functional aging Institute and also NASM senior, uh, fitness specialist. Also, um, certified inclusive fitness trainer through ACSM and, um, you know, put a lot of different information together so that it wasn't just, so you know that you're get the information you're getting, I guess my point is, is that it's quality information quality. It's not from one source, you know? Um, and it's not just like, I never try to include, uh, or I never do when I'm writing courses for fit tour include m the way that I train in the courses. I just try right. I make it all general so that people yeah. can, um, cause I think people are really, um, should use their own creativity and create their own programming from um, the, knowledge. the knowledge that they have. I remember my first um, introduction to Pilates was like in 1997, maybe um, with June Khan. And so Pilates, you couldn't use the name Pilates because the trademark had not been lifted. Yeah, it was still Joseph Pilates. So um, she yeah. came and did through Fit Tour. It was a Fit Tour workshop that she was. Oh, yeah, doing. I remember she was um, part she of was, that. Do you remember when Fit Tour used to have like trainers go out and tour the yeah, whole country? That's where I met Petra. Okay, that's where I met Very Petra. first time. I was at a thing with Fit Tour in San Diego and I thought Petra was the I want to do what she does. <laughs> I know she's the bomb, isn't she? So, um, so when I first started working with Carol Ann for Fit Tour, Fit Tour would send like 
Petra, Gay Gasper. Um, oh, I read that one. So I worked with both of them. I did a tour, uh, like did a weekend um, with Gay Gasper in New Orleans. And that was probably like in 2003 or four. Oh my gosh. I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, I am presenting with Gay Gasper. I was like so excited. And she was so nice and gracious and has always been so kind. And Petra also yeah. um, were, were always so nice. Um, but what I was going to tell you about June Khan is she taught it. She called it core. Um, the workshop was core. And so um, she taught it to us taught us the Pilates principles, but she didn't say it was Pilates. She was just like, these are the core principles. And she, I remember her saying in that workshop, you can use any exercise, use these principles with any exercise and create any exercise you want to create as long as you stay true to these principles and you'll keep your clients safe. And I was like, wow, I can create my own exercise. And that was like in 97, I've been teaching um, I guess I started teaching in like 87, maybe 88. I can't remember exactly, but I had always, you know, copied somebody because mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I was knowledgeable enough to, yeah. to make my own stuff up. But I remember her telling me, you know, telling us that, and it just like res was resonated with me and I was so excited and, you know, she just, um, she's always been somebody that I've always looked up to and, um, at idea, I think, um, in Las Vegas, maybe like 2016, we were on a panel together and I was just like, so like blown away that like, wow, I'm on the panel with June Con, you know? Yeah. Um, but you know, anybody can be anything they want to be. Yeah. All they have to do is work for it. And I always, from the time I started teaching aerobics, um, I took from a, a trainer, Jackie Talley, a lot of people know her um, in the industry um, in Birmingham, how to teach aerobics at University of Alabama, Birmingham. And I took that course from her. And I always just, after um, going through that course, I just loved the way she taught. And I, I want I wanted to teach it. I wanted to teach people how to teach aerobics because I loved it so much. And that's what I always wanted to do. So, um, you know, getting to be able to be a fit tour pro trainer was a big deal to me. Oh, yeah. Me and too. Look back and, and, you know, wow. how we kind of get like we're just a little bit blase about things. Um, and but I didn't think you feel like when you're in the teaching mode, it's like this is where I belong. Yes, I do. That's how um, I feel when I'm up teaching. But, this is my this is my space. This is where she you know is. I had uh, Carol Ann say to me uh, recently. She's with Club Pilates now, and we were talking about Club Pilates, and um, she was telling me that you know I should uh, consider working for Club Pilates because she said besides Fit Taurus, the best thing that ever happened to me, and you know. I thought, wow, you know, Fit Tour is probably the best thing that ever happened to me. Like, as far as career and doing what I love to do, being able to write and and create programming is just, I'm just so blessed. Well, when I first, well, I took all the stuff with Fit Tour. Um, plus, my people were Mia Fennigan, Canada Tom. Oh Tammy yeah, I love Mia Fennigan. And um, Tammy Lee Webb. There were like people I worked out oh, with. I love Tammy Lee too. All of them. Yeah. And I love Corey Everson and her thing. They had, the, they're all in the SBN. And I just, oh, I love them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, when I moved to Oregon, I connected to, with Rhonda on Fit Tour. And that's how I became. i uh, okay. And, but I had to become alpha certified to able to be with Fit Tour. Right. That's the main thing. So I got alpha certified. And then when I was talking to alpha, I became, because I connected to Rhonda's Fit Tour and I opened more doors, I became, um, a test an examiner for the physical part. Was, so yeah. so but that was the day when you actually had to have people watch you move physically right. if you're able to know how to move your own body before you showed it to people. And that was wasn't very long I did that for because they stopped doing that. So I did that for a couple of years. I trained with it, did a couple of things and then they kind of shifted to they're not doing the physical testing anymore. You just do things online. But that's how I got to the alpha thing. But the, having the alpha certification is a backup to everything you do. You need more oh, definitely. certification. Definitely. Um, yeah. So if I didn't connect to Fit Tour, I wouldn't have learned that. So so kind of, that was my thing too. Fit Tour played a big part in my stuff. Oh, yeah. 
But and I, Rhonda's great, right? I love Rhonda. Yeah. We had so much fun in Vegas last time. Well, I was not feeling 100% and she was having, so a lot of times we just, let's go to lunch. <laughs> we were, we so for those of you who don't know, know Rhonda fun. is the, um, Rhonda um, used to manage the trainers um, for Fit Tour. Um, she actually, I met her at a workshop that I did in Birmingham and she was working for Alabama Power and um, she, she uh, was like the group fitness coordinator at the um, club where we had the workshop. And so she said, if you ever need like an assistant or anything, I'd be interested in working with you. And I was like, so oh. you were with Fit Tour before she was. Yes. Yes. Oh, I thought she was. And so, um, so yes. Um, so anyway, um, when I took on the job, um, of, uh, director of education, I was managing the pro trainers and it was just, I was also, man, you know, I also had my own business. So, um, I asked Rhonda if she would be my assistant and help me manage the trainers. And she was like, sure. So, I mean, she was, she was such a good assistant. She was just awesome. And, um, so then, um, I, I can't remember what happened, but anyway, she ended up taking over managing all the trainers, um, for Fit Tour. And then I was the director of education and, um, she, she has always done a great job and, um, she's like, super to work with. She always helps me when I put the courses together. She always helps me with the editing and um, gives me feedback about the, uh, you know, the content and all that kind of thing. Um, she's Rhonda is, you know, just, I can't say enough good things about her. She's a really good friend and she's a good coworker. And who, so for those who don't know, Fit Tour, Robert and his sister were the owners of it. He yes. passed away. And so she he passed away now, right? And so Clara owns it. Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Very such nice people. Oh yeah. So for those of you who are listening, if you're not familiar with Fit Tour, it's F-I-T-O-U-R.com. And they have um we have uh any kind of certification or course you want to go through. They have AFA um approved courses, they have ACE approved courses, and um Hopefully we'll be coming out with, um, you know, ACE just came out with the um, new requirement that you have to go through um, so many hours of professional conduct um, education to renew your ACE. And so um, Fit Tour is, um, that's in the works for Fit Tour to have a course that is approved by ACE as a professional conduct um, CEC that you can I get. I didn't know they did that. Hmm, yeah. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I am so glad you've been here. And like, I can just tell my guests, we're just going to talk. Oh, there's so much to talk about. So we talked about MS. We talked about the fitness centers. So you guys have watched this. You, if you know the industry, you know the people we're talking about. We connect there. And um, I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much, Tracy. I I'm sorry I talked so <laughs> I know, girl, you need to come to South Alabama. I wanted to, I was going to go back to my small town and visit people, but I can't get in a plane right now. I can't sit in a plane. Oh yeah. I'm sitting here for an hour and a half. I'm like, okay, I need to get and go walking now. It, it gets, so I'll tell you from California, it's about a nine hour day. I couldn't <laughs> get do that. To kind of South Alabama. I flew to my small town in Oregon. You know, it's an hour and a half to the airport from there. So I'd have to drive to our airport, depending where I go from. It could be 20 minutes away or half hour away. Sit and wait, get in the plane, sit in the plane two to three hours, all that. Because you load, you fly, you sit, you get off. Right. Then I have to sit in a car and be go an hour and a half. By the time I get there, I'd be ruined. I, I know, girl. But I one know. day I will. One we'll day. take care of that back. I am. My eyes yeah. too. But walking is the best thing. But anyway, thank you so much for being here. Thank, thank you, you so all much for having me. Anytime. And thank you to all the listeners. Um, I know sometimes my shows may be long. We talk. There's things to talk about. You can pause them and come back or listen to all the way through. That's what we're here for. So I hope something we either one of us said was just nice to hear or helped you. And um, you guys all have a good day. Things not flowing here. And we are going to sign off now. So as with Dolly, if you want to reach Dolly. If you want to go to her website or follow her on social media, give you give them your information. Okay, so my website is stokesmethod.com. 
And then my um, social media, Facebook is Dolly B. Stokes and Instagram is Stokes Method. And my LinkedIn is Dolly B. Stokes also. And I'll put them in the wordage under this. But also, if you guys go to Google, you can probably just put Dolly Stokes Fitness and John Stokes Fitness and you find her that way too. Yes, you'll get tons of like the whole page will be Dolly. No, I'm just kidding. You might you find one Dolly B. there. I'm like, oh, who wrote that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you everybody again. Thank you for listening to the Health and Fitness Show with Tracy. If you want to get hold of me, I'm www.tracymarkley.com. Um, you, when you go to my website, all my links there to Instagram and everything, I'm really easy to find and you guys have a good day and thank you, Dolly. Bye Tracy. Bye. Thank you.